Kitchener's Desert Railway, sometimes called the Sudan Military Railway, was a 225-mile track built through the Nubian Desert to support the British-led invasion of Sudan in the 1890s. Experts said it couldn't be done, but it was, and by bringing thousands of British troops into Sudan, it decisively contributed to General Kitchener's victory over the Mahdist army at the Battle of Omdurman. The Desert Railway was one of the most ambitious engineering constructions undertaken during a war by the Victorian British Army. Overseen by a Canadian Royal Engineer, Percy Giraud, using thousands of local labourers who had never seen a railway before, the 200-mile route dramatically reduced the time needed to bring troops and supplies to Kitchener's army, advancing into Sudan to avenge the death of Charles Gordon in Khartoum ten years previously. The railway still connects the Sudanese capital Khartoum to Egypt to this day. However, before it could be completed, Kitchener had to capture the town of Abu Hamad on the River Nile. In a lightning advance, Sudanese troops serving Kitchener advanced 146 miles in eight days. Under the command of Hector MacDonald, a crofter's son who had risen from the ranks, they completed the last 36 miles in just 35 hours to take the Mahdist garrison by surprise. Shocked by MacDonald's arrival, they fled the town, and a month later, the railway was completed. With the railway bringing fresh troops and supplies to his army, Kitchener was in a position to deliver his final blow and advance on the Mahdi's successor at Omdurman. That might be all the info you want about the Desert Railway, but if you want to find out why Kitchener was really invading Sudan and how Percy Giro completed his amazing engineering feat, then here we go. My last story about Britain's wars in Sudan focused on the Battle of Toski in 1889 when an Egyptian army under British General Francis Grenfell had defeated the invading Mahdist army from Sudan. That, to all intents and purposes, brought to a close the first part of this conflict, which had started when the Mahdi's forces had defeated another Egyptian army under yet another British officer, Hicks Pasha, back in 1883. Now, I've told a fair few stories about this period, including General Gordon and the Nile expedition to rescue him from Khartoum, along with some of the epic battles such as Abu Klir, Tamai and El Teb. Have a look back at some of my previous episodes to listen to them. Suffice to say, the revolution by the Mahdi kicked the Egyptians and their British allies out of the country, and an independent Islamic state was established, which managed to hold out as Africa was gobbled up by various European powers. Not that the Mahdi's successor, the Khalifa, was hunkering down and trying to avoid being embroiled in this scramble for Africa. He was keen to export his brand of Islamic revivalism. In 1889, his forces invaded Egypt, but were defeated at the Battle of Toski, which I mentioned a moment ago. In that same year, his forces defeated the independent state of Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia, and stormed the ancient Christian city of Gondor, which they proceeded to plunder, sacking churches and killing priests. So, not only did their neighbours consider the Mahdists a menace, but as the 1890s progressed, European powers started to covet the vast territory of the Khalifa. And whilst it's quick to identify the British wanting to expand their imperial power, others were at it too. The Italians in Eritrea had eyes on possible expansion, and at the same time were wary that the Khalifa was keen to seize their principal port of Massawa. The French, whose huge Western and Central African empire butted up to the Khalifa's western borders, had ambitious plans to use Sudan to create an empire stretching right across Africa, encompassing Abyssinia as well. Even King Leopold of the Belgians, whose private empire covered most of modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo, had embarked on adventures to control parts of, if not all, of Sudan in both 1890 and 1895. And of course, there were the British. Whilst Egypt was nominally part of the Ottoman Empire, it was the British who were effectively controlling the country. Their High Commissioner, Lord Cromer, acted almost like a governor. The British military stationed troops in the country, and the Egyptian army itself was officered by British officers. All of this helped ensure that the British were able to use the Suez Canal to transport goods, administrators, warships and troops to their empire in Asia and beyond. The fact that they'd been unable to rescue General Charles Gordon in Khartoum back in 1885 was a humiliation that many still wanted to write. Not least the commander of the Egyptian army, or Sirdar, General Sir Herbert Kitchener. Kitchener had been an intelligence officer during the attempted rescue of Gordon and was keen to avenge the death of his fellow royal engineer. Through the 1890s, he'd built upon the work of his predecessor, General Grenfell, Victor at Toski, and thoroughly remodelled and retrained the Egyptian army so that it could not just defend Egypt against Mahdist attacks, but could turn the tables and attack Sudan. Finally, in 1896, the British decided to act. Not because the time had come to avenge Gordon, nor because of a specific threat of an invasion by the Mahdists of Egypt. 
but due to an event to the south, in the mountains of Abyssinia. In March of that year, the Italians had suffered a huge defeat at the hands of the Abyssinians at the Battle of Adawa. It was the biggest defeat a European power ever suffered at the hands of an African enemy. 6,000 Italians were killed, and over 3,000 captured. Six times the number of men the British lost to the Zulus at the Battle of Isandwana in 1879. The defeat left the Italians with a very shaky grip on their colony of Eritrea. There was a real danger that the Khalifa could take advantage of that weakness and sweep in. Such an action on top of their recent defeat could seriously weaken Italy's international position, a position that the British, for wider European concerns, were keen to preserve. The Italian ambassador in London appealed to the British to take the pressure off by threatening the Sudanese from Egypt. Whilst Kitchener was keen to march on the Sudanese capital at Omdurman and settled the score on behalf of Charles Gordon, the British government under Lord Salisbury had a much more limited ambition. The further those Islamic warriors had to travel before they reached Cairo and the Suez Canal, the better. On the 12th of March 1896, they authorised the British High Commissioner to order Kitchener to invade Sudan and advance on Dongola, creating a buffer zone between the Mahdist heartland and Egypt. The next morning, the Egyptian government agreed to that decision and rubber stamped the order to the Sirdar of their army. So, if you were in any doubt as to who was in control of Egypt, I think I've just laid that to rest. Kitchener gathered his army of 9,000 men, consisting of 10 infantry battalions, just south of Wadi Halfa, and on the 15th of March, he began his advance on Dongola, 250 miles up the river. At this stage, this was a predominantly Egyptian or Egyptian and Sudanese army. Only a few hundred British troops are present, mainly from the North Staffs Regiment and the Connaught Rangers. On the 23rd of September 1896, Kitchener's army reached Dongola, only to find it abandoned by the Mahdists. With his objective achieved, Kitchener now set off for London, not to bask in the glory of a job well done, but to expand his brief. He wanted to convince the British government to supply British troops for an advance on Khartoum to avenge Gordon and eliminate the Mahdist menace once and for all. It would be a hard task. The British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Michael Hicks' speech, was stingy when it came to imperial projects. He wasn't keen to spend taxpayers' money to avenge a general who died over ten years beforehand. Nor was he keen to waste that same money toppling the Khalifa's regime in Khartoum. After all, the buffer zone that Kitchener had just achieved by occupying Dongola protected British interests in Egypt. As Sirdar, Kitchener had principally used his Egyptian army to achieve that objective. The buffer zone had cost the British virtually nothing. And there, Kitchener might have drawn a blank. But for events elsewhere. He was to benefit from what we often call the bigger picture. The British government might not be desperate to conquer Sudan, but they were desperate not to lose out in the scramble for Africa to another European rival, in particular the French. The British government had become aware of an audacious French expedition making its way across Africa. Led by Captain Jean-Baptiste Marchand, its aim was to march from their West African possessions to their colony on the Red Sea coast in French Somaliland, claiming territory as they went. And Marchand's route would take him across the Sudan. In other words, whilst the British didn't want Sudan, they certainly didn't want the French to get their hands on it, thus preventing the British forming their own North to South Empire running from the Cape to Cairo. Suddenly, Kitchener was given the authority to proceed. The next target for the Sirdar was the town of Abu Hamid. 345 miles north of Khartoum, Abu Hamid lies at the centre of a giant bend in the Nile. Rather than flowing directly north from Khartoum to the delta where it enters the Mediterranean, the Nile dramatically goes back on itself, travelling southwest back into Sudan before then turning north again, passing Dongola before reaching Wadi Halfa and entering Egypt. As the crow flies, the distance across the Nubian desert from Wadi Halfa to Abu Hamid is 230 miles. However, the distance following the Nile as it performs that massive switch back into Sudan is over double that distance. As I say, Abu Hamid sits at the very point where the Nile makes that dramatic turn inland to the southwest. Now, if you're expecting a lightning advance by the British army towards Khartoum, you'd be wrong. Firstly, with limited British troops on the ground in Egypt, Kitchener would have to wait for reinforcements to be sent to him from across the empire. This pause allowed Kitchener to build his logistical support to ensure the invasion's success. Herbert Kitchener liked to cultivate the image of a dashing Victorian hero, but he was more of a methodical soldier than a buccaneer, in many ways more of a Montgomery than a Patton. 
Maybe I should do a talk about Kitchener's career. What do you think? Drop me a line in the comments below. The ultimate victor at Omdurman was an engineer by training, and he was convinced that victory over the numerically superior Mardis in a country as huge as Sudan would only be achieved by careful advances and overwhelming firepower, all backed up by a highly efficient supply chain that would keep his army in the best possible fighting condition. Kitchener decided that the key to moving troops and supplies quickly and in overwhelming numbers was not by river like Wolseley had attempted when trying to rescue Gordon in the 1880s, but by rail. A great idea in theory, but a tall order in practice, seeing as there wasn't a railroad anywhere in Sudan. And his challenge was even greater, as his intended route was not along the Nile, but through 200 miles of Nubian desert from Wadi Halfa to Abu Hamad. It was an ambitious plan and an incredible feat of engineering. When completed, it would transport troops from Wadi Halfa to Abu Hamad in 24 hours, rather than the 18 days it would take by boat travelling up the Nile. Not only would the railway be faster, but it would also negate being dependent on the levels of the river. This would allow Kitchener to move men and supplies year round, and so fight any month he chose. Kitchener was told that such a construction was not possible, certainly not in the timescales that he was envisaging for his war. He ignored those siren voices and picked a man whom he considered to be the best railway builder in the British Empire to head up the project, Lieutenant Percy Girard of the Royal Engineers. 29-year-old Girard had been born in Quebec in Canada. His father was a leading French-Canadian lawyer and politician. Despite his Francophile roots, Girard decided to study at the English-speaking Royal Military College of Canada in Ontario. There, he topped his class in engineering, and in the process became the first Roman Catholic to ever graduate as an engineer from the establishment. Having spent two years working with the Canadian Pacific Railway, he was then commissioned in the Royal Engineers. In 1890, he was appointed traffic manager for the railway at the Royal Arsenal, Woolwich. Here, he was able to learn how to run a whole railway system, albeit a rather localised one. However, those newfound skills as a railway manager, coupled with his previous skills as a railway engineer, were spotted by Kitchener. The Sirdar knew that the Canadian was the man to build his railway across the desert. Girard's first railway project in Sudan was to connect Wadi Halfa with Kitchener's initial forward base at Agashar during his advance on Dongola. But the line to Abu Hamad was an altogether more challenging proposition. Not only would he be constructing a railway through over 220 miles of desert, but he was also far from protection. If the Khalifa had been able to grasp the strategic importance of the railway, he could have adopted a campaign not dissimilar to that adopted by Lawrence of Arabia during the First World War. Hit and run raids and sabotage could have ruined Kitchener's great plan, but it was not to be. Having said that, Girard had enough challenges without Mahdist attacks. His 800 Sudanese labourers, under the supervision of junior Royal Engineer officers, had never built a railway before. All the skills that were easily to hand during the construction of the vast railroads in North America, Australia and Europe were lacking. Girard, a master of detail, compiled a manual, several inches thick, outlining every operation for both the building and the operation of the railroad. Whatever problem his men encountered, he had already thought it through. He also recognised that Kitchener's supply operation didn't just need railway tracks, but trains and wagons operating efficiently and effectively. He established two technical schools to teach his workers the rudimentaries not just of building a railway, but also of operating one, such as station mastering, yard shunting and signalling. The initial locomotives were donated by imperialist and mining magnate Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes had a dream of colonising as much of Africa as possible for the British, and the backbone of his dream was a railway running the length of Africa from Cape Town to Cairo. Thus, the conquest of Sudan was very much in line with his own agenda. The least he could do was donate some locomotives to turn his dream into a reality. By accepting the locomotives, Kitchener and through him Girard had to build the railway to a gauge that would carry them. Thus, the railway through the Nubian desert was the same gauge as the one that Rhodes was currently building northwards from Kimberley to Bulawayo in modern day Zimbabwe. But it was also completely different to the gauge that was being used in Egypt to the north. And it still is to this day. When a cholera epidemic wiped out many of his workers, Girard was forced to recruit Egyptian peasants and even convicts who were offered parole for their labours. And by July, he was halfway across the Nubian desert. But there was a problem. The closer they got to Abu Hamid, the more likely they were to be attacked by the sizeable Mardis garrison there. In other words, for Kitchener's Desert Railway to be completed, Abu Hamid would have to be in his hands first. 
<laughs> With the railway not able to drop off troops anywhere near Abu Hamad yet, Kitchener would have to march up the Nile to seize it. The task fell to Kitchener's Sudanese 11th and 12th battalions under the command of Hector MacDonald. A crofter's son who had risen from the ranks, MacDonald was a fighting soldier, <laughs> almost the opposite of Kitchener. Bold, brave and highly popular with his men. The Sudanese soldiers that he was commanding were exiles who had fled the Mahdist regime and were considered the elite units in Egypt's army. MacDonald and his Sudanese soldiers covered the 146 miles in eight days, nearly 20 miles a day with no road running through the scrubland along the Nile. Actually, due to the extreme summertime temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius, much of the advance was conducted at night, which in itself is another feat. The Mahdist army at Abu Hamid had been expecting an attack by river from Kitchener's steamboats. They had never imagined that he would drive foot soldiers along the bank at such a speed. In the final advance, MacDonald covered an incredible 36 miles in 35 hours. He arrived at the town on the 7th of August 1897, and surprised and demoralised by his sudden appearance, the Mahdists put up a brief fight and then fled. As they retreated back down the river, they met a relief force that had been coming up to strengthen the town against Kitchener. History. But with the town now in British, or at least Britain's allies' hands, the Mardis fell back on Berber. History is full of near misses. The capture of Umbul Hamid was a game changer in the war. Kitchener's Desert Railway reached the town at the end of the following month. And within two years, it would extend all the way to Khartoum and is still the railroad linking the Sudanese capital to Egypt. The Sudan military railway was not just a military masterstroke. It was also an engineering one. Girard had completed a 235-mile railway through the Nubian desert with a workforce who had never constructed a railway before in just 10 months. He would go on to run the state railway in Egypt and then the South African railways during the Boer War. After stint serving as High Commissioner or Governor in Nigeria and British East Africa, he would serve in the Ministry of Munitions during the First World War, but fell out with his political boss, Lloyd George. He died in London in 1932. A mountain in Banff National Park in his native Canada is named after him. But that is all in the future. Back at the end of 1897, with the capture of Abu Hamad and the arrival of the Desert Railway, Kitchener now had a shorter, faster supply route, which was not dependent on the levels of the River Nile. He could conduct a war against the Khalifa at any time he chose. And he could wait for more and more troops to join him. And those troops, British troops, were on their way the Cameron and Seaforth Highlanders, the Warwickshire Regiment and the Lincolnshires. And behind them, even more were coming. Kitchener's dream of avenging Gordon was one step closer. But before he could march on Khartoum, he would have to face a Mahdist army led by the Khalifa's cousin, Mahmud, and the veteran warrior, Osman Digna, who had positioned themselves on the river Atbara. Join me next time as I tell you the story of the Battle of Atbara. In the meantime, explore some of my other episodes about the British wars in Sudan. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.